announcements before we start? I need more abstracts to get. Um, since we reopened, right. um, I think one from Sao Paulo, but we're going to have to tell that person that they can't do a poster via webinar. So um, I know that we're expecting about 15 more from what I've heard. And that will bring the total to about 35 posters. We were at the entire 20 before. Okay. So, yeah, that's a good amount. So, we all went to ASA or Plant Animal Genome, reuse your posters. Yeah, good question. All right, let's go ahead and start then. So, today we have Dr. Dickman. He, uh, he told me he hangs out at the IPGB. BG. <laughs> it's a lot of long words. Here we go. The Institute of Plant Genomics and Biotechnology. Well, thank you uh, for that brief introduction, and uh, thanks for the invitation to come here and speak to you guys today. You're so close yet so far type of thing. Um, but I'm certainly happy to be here. Let's see. So often when I give talk, I give a few talks now, which is the way to advance this. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's all right. So I give I give a fair amount of talks here and there, and I, I find that the farther away, farther the farthest away from College Station I get, the easier it is to tell the audience that this is College Station on a Friday afternoon. You'd be surprised <laughs> that, that, that how how people actually buy that, and I, I try to keep I try not to laugh and try to make them think this is what it's like for us here, but it's not going to work on this audience. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to do is, you know, sort of give you an overview and sort of throwing some slides together to try to give you an idea of what we do, why we do it, and, and those types of things. And uh, I would encourage interruptions, questions, comments, uh, no problem. I don't mind. In fact, I would encourage just to chime in if you have, a, if you have an issue or, or a question at any time during the talk. So this just shows some of the things we've been doing since uh, I've been here about seven years now. We had a couple of genome sequence projects that uh, were fortunately funded and, 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 and done, both with Sclerotinia sclerotiorum. I'm a plant pathologist. I should also say my own department, plant pathology. I'm interested in diseases. You can see the prejudice I have, particularly fungal diseases. So we got a couple of fungi sequences, Sclerotinia, our, our favorite plant pathogen, and also Colatoxin graminiquum, which is a maize pathogen. I'm just saying we've done that. And that's about all I'm going to say about it, because for the most part, I find it, at least with my expertise, pretty boring. It's very descriptive. It's got these genes, it's got that genes. And while a lot of things are happening in plant genomics, to say the least, uh, these projects are still really at the descriptive phase. But they are a nice tool to have when you're, you're doing various types of experiments with these pathogens. But I am going to talk a bit about double normal, at least, at least uh, part of my talk. Is, uh, is, our, is our, one of our main projects. It's looking at why this particular fungal pathogen, which is the biggest pathogen in the U.S. in terms of economics on vegetables, uh, is so successful. It's a very successful pathogen. It infects all dicots. They're, they're, so uh, any broadleaf plant is a, is a host for this particular fungus. We, unlike more specialized fungi, which, which have particular uh, cultivars or even, or even the species that live along the effect. Why is this guy so broadly effective? Uh, I'm going to finish the talks in this order with uh, our work on banana, which usually gets people back awake, and particularly the two major diseases of banana, which are fungal diseases, which is black cigatoka and banana moral wells, and I'll spend some time talking about that. We also work, and I threw this in, namely to see if Hashi showed up, because uh, we look at proline, uh, and have for a number of years as an antioxidant. Proline is well known to be a, uh, uh, an osmolite uh, and, and very much involved with drought tolerance. But uh, we have found, and, and, and others have uh, supported us, in fact, that proline also functions for a variety of biochemical reasons as an antioxidant. And therefore, since oxidative stress is a big deal or very common in plant diseases, uh, we're interested in proline regulation. And I've gone on to show that proline is a very good protectant against things like program cell death, which is a real main, another main cog of what my lab does. We have crossed over to the dark side a little bit. I have to admit, we do some biofuels work, um, uh, both in sugarcane, which, which, the transgenic sugarcane, which I'll just mention in passing, but for cold tolerance uh, down in Westville, down at the Gulf, 
And also a yeast, and the fancy term for this yeast is oleogenic yeast. It's a yeast that produces lots of oil, and the uh, collaboration with Paul de Figueredo over in, in, in the Institute, we're trying to uh, uh, engineer this yeast to, to make more valuable and, and uh, oils and, 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 and high-value products in general. I'm also going to talk about the ones and the other ones I'm going to talk about if I, if I get through this in time. Uh, is our plant bag gene, which is a gene family we discovered in Arabidopsis, and I'll spend some time telling you why we why we uh, deal with the plant bag gene family. And in my lab, in general, these days, it's really centered around uh, death, uh, programmed cell death, and really the mechanisms underlying that. And I'll try to convince you that that's a more than just a morbid. Uh, 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 piece of experimentation. I, I, I have to give some deference to, to plant diseases, and so that's what we really are focused on. And I mentioned Sclerotinia, the genome sequence. It's a, uh, a very economically important pathogen, primarily because there's no viable disease control measures. Breeding has not been terribly effective. Uh, um, spraying is usually not cost effective. And because this guy has a, such a broad host range, things like crop rotation generally do not work. So particularly, and I'll show you the slide of this, in the U mid Midwest of the United States, soybean country, this is a very, very big problem. Not so much here in Texas, except up north. Uh, it's distinguished by, I should at least mention, these sclerotia, these highly melanized black ball-type structures that are very adverse to environmental uh, uh, stresses. So they can, they can persist in the soil, be viable, for upwards of 20 years. Another reason why this fungus is, is in part so successful because its viability is quite, uh, quite pronounced. Okay. So this is one of my favorite slides, even though it's a rigged up slide. This is a soybean in, in Nebraska where I used to be, and this is clergenium on soybean having a very nice time. It, it completely wipes it out. And if you're a soybean uh, pathologist, this is a good place to be because the soybean board uh, is very concerned about this particular pathogen. and. Uh, there's very little to go on at this particular point in terms of controlling the disease by any type of approach you might want to take. So, again, for a number of years, we wanted to know why is this fungus so good at what it does. It infects all broadleaf plants with really no resistance, really an, an appreciable resistance anywhere. So, uh, back in the old days when I used to work in the lab, we, uh, we wanted to look at, try to understand why this fungus is, is so, so strongly pathogenic and so difficult. And one of the things we knew about this fungus uh, was that it produced lots of oxalic acid, dicarboxylic acid, uh, uh, very simple organic acid that the fungus produces as sort of as a secondary metabolite or a, a, a top non-selective toxin, if you will. Um, and it's found in very large concentrations, millimolar concentrations in diseased tissue so it was assumed or presumed that this must be important, but really the role of oxalic acid in disease was not very clear, say, 10 years ago. So we went about making mutants to get to the point here. And so what we did was we just put the fungus on pH indicated dye plate. So this is bromophenol blue. When it's acidified, it turns yellow. So what we did was we zapped the fungus with various mutagens and then plated them out on uh, uh, pH indicated dye plates and looked for guys that no longer change the color. These would be candidates, and this is rigged up to show you this, these are surviving ascospores plated out on bromophenol blue, not changing the color. Therefore, it would be candidates to be defective in oxalic acid. And I wouldn't be showing this to you if that wasn't, in fact, the case. These guys have been very stable mutations. We did a lot of work to try to make, it, make them stable and, and, make, and, and make sure that they were identical, as best we could tell, to the wild-type pathogens, except for their behavior on plants and the ability to produce oxalic acid. So these are good candidates, which we went on to, to characterize, and they're still very viable mutants today. They've been very, very uh, strongly uh, maintained. So of course, being a plant pathologist, you want to put them on plants and see what happens. These are beans. Beans are a fairly large crop in Nebraska where this started. And as you can see, here are some of those sclerotia, and it's very clear that this is the wild type fungus on beans, here's three mutants, non-pathogenic. We've tried this on, uh, over the years, numbers of, of different crop plants, from canola to arabidopsis, and by and large, these mutants do not infect any dicot plant to any appreciable extent. In fact, here we, we do a lot of work with tomato as well. All right, so what is oxalic acid doing? Um, well, you can, if you look in the textbook, if there was a textbook, 
it, it's breaking down cell walls and creating enzymes. So you lower the pH, a lot of pectolytic type enzymes are, are in fact induced at low pH. It can chelate calcium and other cations. It's toxic in and of itself. If you take oxalic acid and dump it on a leaf, you'll, you'll kill the leaf. Uh, and then you look in uh, electron microscopy books that have nice pictures of, uh, of plant development, you'll see oxalate crystals compartmentalized in, um, in vacuoles, uh, beautiful pictures. But if you uh, mess up the vacuum, like scratch the plant with your hands, you'll, you'll get a very, you get a nice rash, because these are very, uh, very toxic uh, to, to your skin type of thing. They use it as a defense response for insects. And then when you do a talk like this, you often you put other activities just to kind of cover yourself in case something really you know, different might happen. But actually, it's the other activities that, that we have focused on. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of that so I don't use all my time on it. But it's the other activities that makes this fungus so interesting to us. So that's a signal molecule. If you, you throw oxalic acid, you'll, get, you'll, you'll acidify the environment. And so you'll get pH-dependent, as well as pH-independent gene and gene uh, uh, expression. It's known, uh, we've worked on in Oregon State, that it, it's involved with guard cell regulation. More closer to home, it downregulates the host oxidative burst. This is one of the earliest and most universal responses of plants to pathogens as well as stresses. You get this burst of, of uh, reactive oxygen species, which often generates a, a plant hypersensitive response and resistance. In this case, it, it shuts down the host oxidative burst. However, so by the same token, it was very confusing, was it also induces an oxidative burst. So when we published this paper years ago, we had, we had we used to call this a conundrum. Uh, I guess we like saying that. But the bottom line was you, you could, you could, you could uh, inoculate the plant with sclerotinia and induce an oxidative burst by all the criteria that people use. But if you, if you wait a little while, you would also dampen the oxidative burst. So you're getting both an inhibition and an induction of the same signaling pathway in the same interaction, which bothered us for a while because we really did not have a good explanation for that. Look at the reviewers didn't, didn't mind as much. Now, more recently, we've shown that it elicits program cell death, it modulates the host redox environment, and it suppresses autophage. You know, I'm just going to touch upon these. These are really what we, what we work on today, and I'm just, I'll just mention it in passing unless uh, people have questions. So I just want to point out in terms of, of, of sort of cell death, which is one of our overriding themes, is that cell death is quite, quite common and universal in, 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 in biomedical field as well as the plant biology field. So here you see xylem formation, and I don't have, I hope, don't have to explain to you about xylem, which is good. Uh, but, but again, xylem are cells that are cued to die to form these conduits for, for transpiration. So they are basically a, a developmental program cell death. Physical pollen relationships, again, as well as recognition of self and non-self, and if that's not happening, you get a programmed cell death. Guard cell regulation in roots, and not guard cell, but root caps, uh, sloughing in, in, in plants is actually, again, a programmed cell death kind of uh, mechanism. And the hypersensitive response, which is a resistant response in plants to pathogens, by definition is a programmed cell death. So the question was to us many years ago, that's, that's all well and good, but do any of these programmed, genetically predetermined cell deaths that we know a lot about in mammalian systems have any relevance to plants? Just to remind, there'll be no test on this, so don't worry. This is a, this is a, a classical uh, plant signaling, I mean, not mammalian signaling, but a big distinction here, in apoptotic life program cell. This is one of the major forms of program cell death, and this is why I'm telling you this is not going to be a test on this, but just to point out to you that there's a lot of these, this is pretty well developed field in the, in the biomedical arena because of the diseases that are associated with this, 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 this sequence of events. But the point I want to make is, is that there's lots of players that go back and forth in sort of series of checks and balances before the cell is committed to die. Okay? Now what's interesting to us, and what I want to show you is this guy right here, this APAP1, which is actually discovered in Texas. And this basically is a, is a protein that, that oligomer, oligomerizes <laughs> with many other proteins in the cell when the signaling for cell death is taking place. It becomes a much higher ordered structure. There's a little bit of processing going on. And, this, and, the, and the, uh, uh, the, the thought, the cell death signal is, is perceived and executed, and the cell dies. Okay? So a cell life death decision is made via this APAP1 oligomeric protein that recruits a bunch of guys to, to, to dictate that process. Well, the point I want to make is not that, 
But the fact that APA, FF1 is an NBS LRR protein and actually has more sequence similarity to the tobacco resistance gene, which is known as N, than it does for the other human genes in this gene. There's about eight members in the gene family of human genes. And this, these, this guy has more similarity and functional equivalence to a tobacco resistance gene than it does to its other sieves. Again, the idea that a lot of these things, we believe, are in fact conserved. All right. So this is just it's going off on this type of conservation to show that these core pathway members uh, between, say, C. elegans, worm, and, and mammals is highly conserved. You have a, an anti-hepatotic gene keeps cells alive in the mammalian systems. This is, this is the counterpart. And BCL2 is, a, is actually an oncogene, B-cell lymphoma. Again, you're keeping cells alive. This could be bad in, in this particular case. But nevertheless, in terms of worm development, a similar sequence of events where it, it, it inhibits these, mod, these, these cell death proteins that build up higher order oligomers, and then activate that process and activate enzymes that kill the cell. Okay, so you can take a BCL2 mutant cell line and complement it with SED9, those kinds of things. So they're functionally equivalent. However, when you go to look at the plant side of the fence, what you see, what, what I'm showing you is a lot of question marks, and, and that is because we really have not yet identified these core pathway members. Yet myself and others have, have suggested that these pathways are conserved. Then you get grant reviews back saying, how can they be conserved? They, you know, they still sell balls and animals, and there's all the differences, and the fact that the genome databases do not show anything. So that's a hard uh, criticism to have to uh, uh, sort of alleviate, but we think we've been able to do that a little bit. But importantly for this slide, at the end of the day, many plant processes uh, are involved with program types of cell deaths. Uh, it's just how they get there that is, is still not very clear. Okay, so again, years ago, just as I was coming over here, uh, we did a pretty naive experiment, but it ended up uh, uh, taking a lot of our time. And as we had worked on mycotoxins in, in Nebraska, we were especially uh, corn, uh, where there were a lot of toxigenic fungi like fusaria, with a few secondary metabolites that are sort of carcinogens. Fumonacin is a very good example of that. And fumonacin induced these program types of cell deaths in maize cells, but also in uh, uh, monkey kidney cells. It's interesting. But I'm not, we're not a mammalian uh, research group, so we wanted to do something more close to home and plants. I had a summer student. And the short of it is he took a bunch of these genes, as you see here, from very diverse source, sources, threw them into tobacco, and looked. At, he was just interested in learning how to you know, techniques and blots and things like that, transformation, et cetera. But we figured we, we'll throw them in. We got them expressed. Well, maybe they, uh, did, did they do anything? And much to our admitted surprise, they did. I wouldn't be showing you this. So, so here you see tobacco again. And, and as I told you, sclerotinia, this fungus that has been inoculated, basically demolishes most plant tissue that it has, especially if it, can, it, can, it can access the cells and kill them. So here you see tobacco leaves that are going down pretty good by the fungus. And then surprisingly, for quite some time, we would get results like this with the transgenics. Now, I've already told you that traditional and, and generally successful breeding and things of that nature uh, did not work with this fungus. So we're putting a, you know, a, you know, a chicken gene in, and we're getting disease resistance. So I told him to go back and do it again, like three, probably about five or six times. I told him to get it right, and uh, <laughs> he kept he kept because you know we, we realized that this is this is kind of unusual, and to some degree it doesn't make much sense. However, after honestly six or eight months of doing this and doing crosses in tobacco and things like that, which I won't I won't show you, trying with different types of pathogens, we began to start believing in it. And if you look back, it's not so, such a big a stretch as perhaps you might think, because this fungus is a necrotrope it wants to kill. These genes inhibit cell death, and if they actually were to function analogously in plants, this is actually what you might expect. This fungus has to kill cells to get nutrients, or else the ball game is over, drive home safely. So it appears that these genes, we tried them all and, and things of that, and we've made mutants and done a lot of work before we came before we published this, because of the fact that it's so unusual an observation. And if it's true, it has a lot of implications. But, you know, it's, it's questionable. However, we repeated this, as I said, for a long, long time in many, many different ways. And here's for an example. So we made a mutant BCLXL. This is a chicken gene, chicken developmental gene. 
And because these genes are very well characterized, you can easily make mutations that render them null. So we've done this with lots of different genes. We know the mutation. Bottom line is, in every case, if you knock out a functional anti-death gene, you lose resistance, okay, in transgenics. And again, if you look at the, the wild type, in fact, you can see this white stuff is actually fungal mycelia. So the fungal grows along the surface, and because it cannot kill, it runs out of carbon, we believe, and basically, that's it. It, it, can't, it can't really do much more, and it, it's just basically stuck on the leaf, and the leaf is just fine. If you knock that, that, that transgene out by, by any number of ways, you lose that resistance. So it's consistent with regulation of cell death being important. So again, I'm summarizing a lot of work for the sake of time. Uh, it's just that most people have considered sclerotinia as kind of a brute force, unsophisticated, uh, aggressive pathogen that basically attacks plants, and the plants are just innocent bystanders that have to take it. And we actually think that's not true and a little naive, and actually what we believe happens to the fungus, well, we don't give the fungus as much credit as it deserves, but it actually gets into the plant, sees what's going on, and hijacks, if you will, or subverts plant pathways that mediate cell death, okay? Thus, thus forcing the plant to make uh, uh, food that only the fungus can use because it lives off dead cells. So it's a nice way for the fungus to, to have its way at the expense of the plant. And the plant does try to co compensate for that, but if the fungus has the upper hand in the sense of controlling cell death, in a simplistic conclusion, it wins. So if the fungus can control cell death pathways in the plant, fungus wins by gaining nutrition. As you'll see in a second, if the plant is controlling cell death in a hypersensitive type response, you get a resistant phenotype, and the fungus basically runs out of carbon and the plant wins. And that's a bit oversimplified, but actually that sort of scenario is held up reasonably well. What about slowing down the disease cycle? In that, between. Yeah, well, that, yeah that, that works as well, but only to a degree. So you can, you can buy yourself some time. In fact, even if you inoculate the plant with fungus that's grown under very limited nutrition, because it needs carbon, it'll slow down the progression of the disease. But only, it's, not, it's, it's, it's sort of a quantitative thing. The plant still dies ultimately, and, and the farmers, the growers, you know, don't have any, basically have limited yield. So it's not entirely practical for them. But again, there's not many uh, alternatives that's part of the problem. You can also ask, what about viruses? Viruses would love this because the cells are alive, and that's true. So you're actually helping viral disease, a trade-off. And that also is true. But if you're in Nebraska or Iowa growing soybeans, you'll take that trade-off every time because this fungus is really bad on soybeans. You know, I saw you the the picture, but I, I can show you real field pictures where people, if it's wet, the, the, the growers are in big trouble. So they'll take that trade-off to, to have sclerotinia tolerance over virus resistance. How quick does the, how quick does the, the fungus spread? Well, it depends on the conditions. I mean, like, for example, in Texas, it's a little too warm here. But it's a temperate pathogen. So if you go up to the Midwest and it's wet, like the weather we've been having, it's bad. I mean, this is perfect sclerotinia. It's also cool now. So this is really good weather for sclerotinia because it doesn't like it super hot and it likes it wet. And so if you have that, I mean, I can tell you, spraying, things like that just really don't work that well. Uh, and, and soybean being the, one of the biggest culprits uh, for that scenario. It's a, it's a great host. And the people working on soybean scourging are doing very well up there because it's such an important problem. I have a postdoc who's up, up in Wisconsin now who just got there, and he has become Mr. Soybean, and, uh, because, <laughs> and rightly so, because he's, got, he's getting a lot of support and there's you know, a lot of it's serious interest in trying to control this. Okay. Uh, we're almost on the plant pathology stuff. Um, so one of the things we noticed... Uh, and, and, and this is one of the uh, oxalate mutants that does not non-pathogenic. Is that the phenotype look like this? And what, what I mean by that is you see, a you see a ring of necrosis, and then it's restricted. It basically stops there. Now I'll, I can tell you, when I'm in the plant path department. Everybody knows that's the hypersensitive response by classic definition. It's, it's, a, it's basically a rapid localized cell death that serves to delimit the pathogen, as you see here. And here's the wild type. These are on tomato. And there, you know, the wild type is, is having a good time once again eating the uh, eating bee. But the, the point is, is that this looks, well, 
This looked like what you would see in gene for gene interactions that you guys see on cereals, okay? Cereal rust diseases, things like that. This is the resistant response if you have that kind of germplasm. So why would sclerotinia, which is completely unrelated to those kinds of diseases, biotropes, if you will, have this, what looks like that kind of phenotype? So this kind of surprised us. So we took a look at it, and of course I wouldn't be showing it to you, and we looked at things that are associated with serial disease resistance, and, and I, it won't be a test on this either. This is um, um, aniline blue staining, the callus deposition. Callus deposition is one of the most common responses of, of, of biotropic organisms in, in plants, particularly with respect to bacteria or rust fungi, which are, again are biotropes. So here you see in the wild type, it's just kind of evenly dispersed, not much going on. But here you see clear deposition of aniline blue. This is very diagnostic to these kinds of reactions. And again, it was surprising because this is a very different kind of organism, which you would not expect that. So when we published this, again, people were kind of upset because it didn't, didn't, didn't fit quite well. So we went on to show one of the other big manifestations of these kinds of interactions is the oxidative burst. As I mentioned it before. This is a, a rapid, again, uh, in induction of reactive oxygen species and, and hydrogen peroxide. And it's, again, it's a defense response. So here we are looking at, at, at DAB staining, which stains for peroxide. And here's the mutant that doesn't cause disease, showing lots and lots of a, a real pronounced oxidative burst. This is just like you see. You can even see the mycelia staining as well, the fungal propagules. But if you look in the wild type, which is causing disease and going to kill the plant, amazingly, this is, this is extremely clean. It looks like the plant does not see the fungus. And I can tell you, the next day, this leaf is completely obliterated. So the fungus is somehow suppressing, avoiding, redirecting plant recognition. Because this, here you can see the fungus, and the plant is perfectly clean. So what it suggests is, is, is the fact, again, that something else is going on. And I, I think I'm just going to summarize this again for the sake of time. I want you guys to get your money's worth. Um, so, I, so the take-home lesson there is that, indeed, the fungus induces a biotropic-type response and we've now uncovered a difference in lifestyle in this fungus, which we've recently talked about. So the fungus actually has a biotropic phase. So why would it want to have a biotropic phase? It doesn't induce any defenses. Right. So, it, but, it, but, but again, the fungus likes dead cells. But, so what we think is happening is that it's a timing thing. When I talked about how oxidative stress comes up and, and goes down in the same interaction. So the, the, the result of that is, is what I just told you is that the, the fungus looks like it suppresses the oxidative burst, buying itself time to establish itself. The plant doesn't detect, doesn't turn on defense compounds. We've shown this now. And that actually, as, as a result, the fungus is able to grow, put itself in a nice niche, and then redirects the plant cell, that, then turns on cell death pathways, and it's having lunch. And we've actually gone on to show that that is indeed the case. I see I took the slides out, because I knew I'd be running you know, to the time back. Okay. Let's look at death in a little more detail. This is the Rhabdopsis wild type, and here's Sclerotinia, our friend, again, infecting it very nicely. Here's the mutant doesn't infect. We, we, we use the C. elegans, the, the worm developmental gene. Again, like, as we've done in the past, you, you prevent disease in this sort of rigged up assay with Rhabdopsis. But if you look at the mutant, it doesn't really look any different. It's, it's dying, but it really doesn't look like it's dying. It, like, like it's any different than the wild type, which is dying here. So we wanted to think maybe the cell death that's taking place here differs from the cell deaths that are taking place here. So we took a look at that. And I'll, I'll just cut to it. There are a couple of ways cells can die in terms of genetics. One is apoptosis, which is a big deal in the mammalian field because of the biomedical implications. And the other one is autophagy, which is a big hit, which is again a, uh, was found in yeast starvation and is now emerging as a major mediator of, of all kinds of plant physiologies and fungal physiologies. So here you just see, the so wild type induces an apoptotic response. I didn't show you any of that, but it, it does. And when we, we're staining with uh, uh, MDC here, which is a, a specific stain for autophagosomes, autophagy, and it's staining very well. Uh, as you can see, the wild type is not. We can do lysotract, which stains acidic organelles, and you can see it's loaded with with, with, with uh, hits, again suggesting that the mutant, which is non-pathogenic, is inducing an autophagy type response. What, what's important for, about that for us is it tells us kinds of pathways. The pathway is well known in, in maize and rhabdopsis. 
It's like 35 genes, it's a complicated pathway, it's a lot, but it's a lot known about it. So we can start looking at effects on these pathways in an in a indirect way to try to control sclerotinia pathogenicity because we know the mutant and the wild type clearly differ in their response to autophagy signals. So it gives us clues on what to do to try to control this disease. And just to show you, autophagy is very hard to detect because you need to use the EM really. And this is a time course of what autophagy looks like. There's a lot of work, so I'll show you these are a lot of vesicular activity going on when the signals are, are manifested. These, autophag these autophagosomes, which are dual membrane, very diagnostic, and that's what the stains are uh, picking up, loads its cargo. This is what, what the terms they use. It loads its, and the cargo is cellular debris, organelles, amino acids. So remember, autophagy is a stress response. So if the cells are dying, they undergo a, a, a cell death, take the debris, and feed the neighboring cells. It's a way to maintain cellular homeostasis. So what you see here is a really nice view of the cargo. Here's these double membrane organelles that are delivering their cargo. And here's an empty ghost. You see just a nice picture of autophagy, just so you see what it looks like. Here's the wild type, which again is going to kill the cell. And you see none of those types of structures there. In fact, you see the membranes, as, as it is in a normal apoptosis, are maintained. The integrity is maintained. And that's a di very diagnostic for that disease. OK. I'm going to keep pushing forward. That's just a nice slide. Summarizing all that, we really like oxalic acid. It's, it's a very interesting molecule because it does so many different things. And, and I just want to summarize this, article, this, this slide just to, to mention to you, and this is our conclusion to a lot of work, which I went over pretty quickly. And that is, it, it, cell death is a readout in both of these sort of uh, interactions. So when the wild type infects, it kills a bunch of cells, eats the debris. When the mutant is challenged on the plant, you get autophagous cell death, which is what I was showing you previously. So you also get cell death. One is involved with autophagy, one is involved with apoptosis. But in both cases, cell death occurs. So what we're postulating is that it's not cell death per se that's really the important thing, but it's the way you get there. There are a lot of ways to kill cells, I can tell you. And basically, we're, we're saying, however, how the cell death pathways are controlled is the key element in dictating how this disease comes out. Not cell death per se, but how it gets there. So that's what we're working on right now, is looking at whether, how this gets suppressed in the wild type, how it gets induced in the mutant, and how the cell death pathway and what's in the cell death pathway that it triggers these very different responses, one being life of the plant, one being death of the plant. Okay? So now you're, now you're up, to, up to date on that. So I, I'm going to skip all this effect. Unless you guys are into effectors, I'm going to skip the effectors. Very popular area right now. And we, we, have, we have an effector story as well. But I'm going to go up to this because I think that might be more interesting. All right. So we wanted to identify what I might call death on demand. You know, the way to just re, uh, reproducibly impose a stress and get cell death to take place in a, in a, in a consistent manner. Why? So two reasons. One is... We want to understand cell death pathways. These pathways are very poorly understood in plants, and, and, and the underlying mechanisms and players really not clear in any of these kinds of interactions. The other reason is, is more practical. If this is all true and you buy this kind of stuff, then we should be able to deploy genes that mediate this process for enhanced crop performance. So we want to really look at plant performance on, on these, and we want to, look on, we want to uh, understand the pathways a lot better than we do now. The problem is, BCL2, I told you, stands for B-cell lymphoma. Regardless of your opinion on transgenic plants, B-cell genes and oncogenes are not going out in the field, I promise you, regardless of how well they work or any other thing. It's another seminar in terms of that. But irrespective, they're not going out in the field. So we want to get plant genes that have similar functions, if we can, which we believe are, 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 are present, and really sort of negate that particular criticism and we'll, we'll get and, and that's what's happened. We've identified plant genes that seem to do the same types of things and how will they behave if we could try to get plants to, to withstand adverse environmental conditions and diseases better. So we're after genes for two re those two reasons. And anyone who's worked with pathogens can will attest to the variability in pathogens. I mean, the, trying to not get consistent inoculations, it's it's kind of a pain. It's a lot, you know, the timing differs. Well there's lots of Sort of experimental issues, but if you can just take these kinds of uh, abiotic stress induces, you can you can re well the ideal is you can reproducibly impose a death signal, 
and then start looking for genes that are involved with that, that, that signal transduction. <coughs> it's a lot easier to give them heat, cold, drought, or salt, uh, and, and look at it from, and induce cell death from those viewpoints. So I'm, I'm going to skip all the assays we did. I thought I'd put it in here. So we took two approaches to death on demand. One was using yeast and genomics, and the other was computational, which is what you're seeing now. So the idea is if, if plants are, are similar in terms of undergoing cell death processes, then we, by predictive modeling, perhaps we can identify some of these guys. And this took a long time, and I had a really good student who was good with computers and some, some collaborators uh, as well, who helped us uh, look, look at look at the Arabidopsis genome and, and actually NIH3T3 cells genomes and look for structural similarities. We look for genes that are involved with cell death in animals and look for structural similarities in Arabidopsis. And I wouldn't be telling you this again. We didn't get it, and that's what we have. So we got these bag genes. We stand for BCL2 associated ethanogenes. You're actually co-chaperones. You're involved with cl in cancer clinical trials as we speak. Um, and this is actually quite a bit known about them. Rabidopsis has seven of these guys. They're, they're uh, featured with this bad domain, which is pretty amorphous. And they have a bunch of other motifs. So we, we, uh, we, we, what's nice about a Rabidopsis is, if I can change this, well, let me show you this first. Well, what's nice about a Rabidopsis is you, there's a lot of genetic res resources, and you can get mutants very easily just by making a phone call. But what I want to show you is that it binds HSP70. There's a lot known about these genes, and, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time unless you're interested. But the point here, this is human, this is a human bag gene. This is the Rabidopsis bag gene. And I, we're not going to, again, we, we don't care about the, uh, the catalytic site and the, the alpha helical structure and all this, except for the fact that you can sit in the back of the room and hopefully just see that these guys look structurally very similar. We don't care about what the motif is or any of this other stuff. You just look at these two guys, they look pretty related, and in fact they are. You would never find this in a blast search, because the, sequence, the DNA sequence similarity is too low. But if you look at structures, water accessible surfaces, hydrophobicity, you can do this very easily on the computer, uh, and generate these kinds of models, and we've done that. And indeed, these guys fall out remarkably similar even though it, you don't, you will not detect this at a blast search. So we were encouraged by that, and we, you know we have the new confocals. We had to use it, uh, but we took these seven family members and put GFP and RP and all, localized them. And interestingly, they all go to different organelles. And again, that's another seminar. But we have a, a real interesting one that we've already published on is is, is an ER localized bag gene. We have nuclear localized bag gene. We have them really localized to all the different organelles as well as the plasma membrane uh, and cytoplasm with this gene family. So we just think this is a gene family that is, is sort of uh, involved with um, keeping cells from, from, from uh, going down to various environmental stresses. And they're like sort of uh, platoons of, of soldiers keeping everything intact by, by protecting against uninitiated or un unintentional program cell death. So I don't, I don't need to show you all the pictures, but we're able to localize them, uh, and that's all I need to say. Okay, so we looked at, so we started looking at these knockouts, because again, you can get them on the telephones very easily, and these are Arabidopsis. And what you'll see is if you knock out bag four, the, the numbers don't matter, uh, and this is just normal tissue culture meeting, you see salt stress. These are all, these, this plant will be dead by the next day due to, due to salt. These are normal levels of tissue culture salt, okay? The one that was most interesting to us is this AT bag 6, because you knock this gene out, which you'll see here, it's now very susceptible to a pathogen that normally does not infect. This is botrytis, a great pathogen, and, and it doesn't normally infect Arabidopsis, as you can see here. But when you look, put them on this knockout, they, they demolish the plant. So we've, we've knocked out basal resistance. So we're interested in that because we'd like to know what that is, because it's pretty poorly understood. And these are controls. I mean, on, on these plants, Try this doesn't really doesn't infect really at all. But what was interesting to us in a practical sense is this ATP over expression. This is again a very sophisticated experiment. We just stopped watering the plant and waited. And as you can see here, if you don't water plants, they will die. And what you see here is a, is, is a <laughs> tobacco plant about two weeks old, and it's going down and it's not coming back. That's all I want to reverse. Whereas this guy, while it was not growing to any great extent, it's completely viable, still green, and it stops 
if you started watering now, this guy would do nothing, this guy would come back and be all fine. So in, in terms of a practical sense, and talking to the few readers I talk to, it, you don't have to hit a home run. You can hit a single or a double and just allow these guys to hold on under the, on the harvest time, for example, that week or two when it's really hot and dry, you can salvage these plants. That's one of the things we hope to do. You don't have to have complete resistance. We're not going to get it. But if we could get where we, where we can tweak the system enough so it holds on for a period of time and, and stays that way. I used to have these in my office because this thing is so light. I mean, there's no water in here whatsoever, yet, uh, yet it, it, this, this is still viable and we'll, grow, we'll come right back. And that's his bag for him. Okay. So those are the kinds of things we were doing. Um, okay. I'm gonna. This is our our export. So why would you see all this 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 broad range um, protection? And, and again, when I give this talk, often I say, look, it's it's, in, it's protecting against a bi you know biotic stress, which is pathogens, but also it protects. And I didn't show you the data because again, because of time, but it also protects against abiotic stress. So you know, it sounds like snake oil. I'll be the first to admit it. However, if you look at some of these things in more detail, maybe not. That's what this, this is sort of a model. And that these guys may be cellular sentinels, these antibiotic genes, which is what they are in our bodies. And they have varying specificities. And they make the life cell that decision. But you can also go upstream if you want to sort of play these models. And you know, a lot of the genes that are induced by fungi, virus, and bacteria, so-called PR proteins, for example, which get us misused a lot, are also induced by these stresses. So as far as the plant's concerned, it may not be that different responding to a virus or heat shock. And in fact, a lot of promoters that we look at in these plants have these multiple specificities. So it's, it's, it's also possible that as the plant recognizes danger and does what it needs to do to respond to it, or it's later in a given pathway and, and it makes the decision closer to the uh, time it needs to, again, based on the given stress response. One of the overriding themes, and this is our prejudice, uh, with the, all of these responses is the induction of reactive oxygen. This, this happens, the induction of reactive oxygen happens in all of these stresses, and it's been published by many people, including us, as well as all these pathogens. When you perturb membranes, ROS comes up. And so one common feature among all these stresses is ROS, which could be an important factor in, in mediating these processes. We're, we're trying to verify that in, in, in better detail. Uh, again, for time, I'm going to just go through this quick. So bag six is the lesion mimic phenotype. Are you guys familiar with lesion mimic phenotypes? It's found a lot in agronomy. It's the cool phenotype because what it, what it is is, is you'll get lesions, or as you see here in tobacco, in with no pathogen. You get disease symptoms, but there's absolutely no pathogen. So whatever mutation has taken place, you've knocked out normal resistance. This is not uncommon. It's found in many crop plants, actually. So this bag six creates lesion mimics. It has a human caspase one cleavage site. I'm just showing you that because we know it's processed. I'm going to I'm going to go through this quick for the sake of time. But it has a, uh, a caspase one. Caspases are those enzymes that kill cells and uh, kill our cells, uh, dedicated to apoptotic cell death. So it has a caspase one site, predicted caspase one site in the, in, the, in, the, in the gene that we in this AT bag six. And we can cut it with human bag. We can cut it with uh, a, uh, human caspase one, and it'll cleave. We can also take PAMPs as well as the fungus and get cleavage. So this this becomes activated. I'm going through this quickly by cleavage and protein processing. We identified the site very nicely by using inhibitors. So it turns out to be. And I'm saying this in case anyone has some good ideas. It's it's a, 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 a pepstatin inhibits this. This an aspartic protease inhibitor. So we believe we have an aspartic protease that interacts with this BEG6 to mediate plant resistance, which is, I'll just show you, uh, well, I'll show you the next one. We've actually done quite a bit of work on this. In autophagy. So if we try to tax the plant, these are all transient assays, and induces in a normal, I mean, Rabidopsis is resistant to botrytis, and here you see those autophagosomes again. So botrytis, with the help of an aspartal protease, which we'd like to understand better and we don't yet, triggers autophagy and plant resistance. If you knock that aspartic protease out or doing any number of other kinds of controls, botrytis is not only, the plant's not only resistant, but very susceptible to botrytis. I took those slides out because I knew I'd be running. And I should be up that summary. This is, this is the last section that I wanted to rush to get to that. 
And that is uh, our favorite crop, bananas. And bananas are really good if you're a molecular type. And why is that? Because they don't have no genetics. You can't have, there's no breeding program for bananas. Because you go to HEB and buy a banana, there's no seed, right? So because of lots of things, they, people have run with clonal bananas and there's a, there's a potential issue with, when you do that, right? So uh, as a result, there's really no traditional or, uh, or any kind of disease control for bananas. And there are a number of countries, developing countries, where banana <coughs> is in fact a staple. And I'll give you one example we use a lot, and that's Uganda. Uganda, if you, if you, Uganda is, it uses bananas as a staple, so it's banana, uh, uh, banana bread, banana dessert bananas, cooking bananas, banana wine, banana beer. Everything they consume has, been, has banana, banana as a basis. So you might imagine when there's a disease occurring for which there is no control, actually it results not only in starvation but death. And it's very sobering when I first met some, some Ugandan people. I mean, if we didn't have bananas here for a couple of weeks, I think we would, we would be okay. But they're not. So again, knowing that, you, you can't just uh, do, do a breeding program, which is what's needed. Uh, leaves, leaves it very open to alternative <coughs> disease control measures. The two major pathogens of banana are fungi, which is again good for me, and they're necrotropic fungi, fusarium and mycospirella, they like to kill. So this is also good for me. So I was at a meeting where I learned all this, and I ran into a, what is now my collaborator in Australia, and it became clear maybe we can engineer these plants with some of these antihepatotic genes and maybe control these diseases, especially given that there's basically no other alternative. So we ended up writing a grant at this meeting with a few beers, got funded, and we're off to the races. <laughs> That's one of the advantages of going to meetings and drinking beer. <laughs> So the, 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 uh, the, the question is, so why, why is biotechnology a suitable approach in this particular case? Well, this is Malaysia, and this is after three weeks of fusarium. It's toasted. And, and what's happened, uh, again, I don't know if you know, it's getting some press, even in science, is that this, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the banana cultivar Gros Michel was delicious. I can tell you, I'm, unfortunately, I'm old enough to know that. Most of you are not. But it's very sweet really good banana, and what happened is you put out a lot of acreage of, of, a, of a certain genotype, you're asking for trouble, and by the 60s, there was a new race of the pathogen, this fusarium, that killed everything inside, which they were formerly resistant. So now the Cavendish, which is what you guys buy in the store, which is not ne nearly as good, is now susceptible to this new race. And as Borlaug pointed out, on you know, more than one occasion, uh, and I, I could give a seminar on Borlaug alone, uh, the clock is ticking. You know, these, are going to, these races are going to evolve, they're going to come back, and we're going to be, people are going to starve. And he was completely correct. So there was a new race of the fungus in the 60s that now killed Cavendish, which is the main cultivar that people planted throughout the world. And they, they, they uh, took care of that with the variant of Cavendish, eventually, through, through just selection. And in the last three or four years now, there's another new race, tropical race for a very famous pathogen now, Infusarium. Uh, and we're working on this particular one, which now uh, is threatening the world. Because if it gets into Africa, for example, which it's not, there's no control. So it, it could be a big problem if we're not prepared. So there's a reasonable amount of interest around, around, around the world kind of thing to try to get a handle on this. And again, we could spend time, which we won't, on, on the pathogen and its effective repertoire. It's an interesting pathogen and how it evolved. To, to parasitize the, these bananas where normally was unable to. How does that work? Why does that work? It's a lot of good questions, just basic research. The bottom line is, if this, if this spreads as it is doing, and as inevitably will do, problem. Okay. All right, so, so we got some money, as I told you, to back backtrack a second, to put these genes in, in, in plants. I just want to show this is a banana, typical banana transformation. It takes a long time, I can tell you that, and it's tedious. And basically, it's a numbers game. It's all, they're all black, they're dead. If you look around, you can see a couple of greenish-looking tissue, and it's a numbers game. You put out a zillion uh, 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 embryonic cell suspension cultures, and a couple will come back. So you get a couple. But we put it in with these transgenes, which keep cells alive. It's really uh, not black at all. In fact, our transformation frequencies is 25 orders of magnitude higher 
than, than without it. I mean, we've actually quantified this. I'm not going to do it. With banana, and it depends on the trans, there's variability. The bottom line is the, the transformation frequency is tremendously increased, which is a byproduct of, of the study. The main thing was to get these guys in. This is just to prove to people they're apatotic-like. You guys don't need to care about that. These are roots. This is uh, showing that ap cell, program cell death is taking place in these bananas. Remember, these are agrobacterium inoculations. Agrobacterium normally does not infect bananas, even though plant molecular biologists think agro was placed on Earth for them. Actually, uh, b bananas are not a host. It's a dicot pathogen. So when banana sees agro, we think, it recognizes non-cell and goes through a cell death apoptotic-like response to get rid of it. When you keep these cells alive by the presence of transgene, uh, agrobacterium, or the banana in this case, is way more competent for DNA uptake, and the transformation frequencies are, are significant. In fact, we're doing this in beans right now, which is another very difficult crop to, uh, to transform. Okay, this is what I wanted to get to, the bottom line stuff. So these are lady fingers, real bananas, stuff like that. And here's Panama wilt. This is Fusarium, and you can see it's wilted. It's the wild type, and these are two transgenics. Okay, so here, here, here you see it again, and this again, you can see why it's Panama wilt. It's a vascular disease. So you're going to get it in the plumes. I'm, here you see the vascular system of a transformed banana. It's black, it's dead, the fungus is having a good time, it's Fusarium. And when you put the transgene in, do the same experiment, again, this is a developmental gene in C. elegans, and now we've done this with plant genes. I just have these good pictures, so I use them. But as you can see here, this, they're not black at all. They're completely white. They're completely protected. There's no cell death occurring. These plants look pretty good. So we were happy with that, but anyone who know, works in a greenhouse with a lab knows that stuff in the field doesn't necessarily translate. Oh, so this one, just to show you, we also got drought tolerance. And at the beginning, well, who cares, but this is a, a student's thesis. So we took a look at that, and indeed, these, these 10 nine lines are also drought tolerant. And you could say, like we did, who, who cares? I mean, we want disease resistance. But with global climate change being a, a, a big deal and global warming being a big deal, in Uganda, where it's very green, very nice, they now have periods of time with the weather where they go through pronounced periods of drought. Even though it still rains a lot, the pattern of rain makes predictions not so, not so good. And as a result, these, they, they are interested in these plants because they are facing drought tolerant situations, even in Uganda where it rains a lot, because of the weather patterns are now a little bit on the flaky side. So we also got drought tolerance. So I'm just going to finish with, 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 the, with the horror story of the other part of this project. So we, have, we were able to get some, some Gates money uh, and for disease resistance in my view, but all of the Gates proposals that have plant components are involved vitamin A. So you're familiar with carotenoids and vitamin A and golden rice? So golden rice is basically vitamin A uh, increases and the one so I'm going to tell you about it's the same thing. Again, vitamin A de uh, deficiency is a big disease among children. Hundreds of thousands a year die from blindness. I mean, that was the whole point behind golden rice. Which is, again, another seminar. Because they've had their troubles. So the idea was is to, is to knock out these, a path, the pathway to carotenoid A and force everything to go to the carotenoid B, get tons of carotenoids, and people would eat bananas and would be protected from these, these diseases, and the world would be a better place kind of thing. And it was just an unbelievable pain in the neck to do this experiment. So it sounded good. Knock this pathway out, we'll feed it into the other pathway, or vitamin A pathway. And once you started messing around with, with metabolites, all kinds of things happen that were unexplainable, that type of thing. For example, we, we, we could take the phytoene desaturase, take it from uh, maize, put it in the plant, and we could have the same enzyme activity taken from, say, sorghum. Same enzyme, same gene, same enzyme activity, but just a different source. Completely different when you put them in bananas. So you put the same enzyme in from two different sources, they completely behave differently. So it took a long time to sort through this, six, seven years, according to my friend in Australia. Um, but we put, he's finally, he did the trench work on this, finally has got this working. And I'm, but I'll show you, and I'll just show you this. So we have, we have got orange bananas. These are high carotenoid producers. And I do this because people who've been sleeping the last half hour now wake up. And, and <laughs> the point is, these are not going to be on commercial, commercial use. This was just a game we were playing to see how much we can push the expression, because it was a big pain in the neck trying to, make, trying to get these expression 
trying to get expression high enough to be feasible. So we pushed it beyond the levels necessary that the FDA, we have FDA approved levels and all this kind of stuff. And you can see we got lots of orange bananas. None of these are going to be commercially viable. But these are, and this is, so the FDA has, has stipulated concentrations and all that stuff. So we've met them very easily. But it wasn't that easy. But we've met them. These are plants, these are the same plants in Uganda. These are the vitamin A. They look just fine. They, they grow well. There's no, bottom line is they're now in human field trials in Iowa. And to make all that regulatory story short, uh, they could be on the market, in, realistically be on the market in Uganda in about a year or two. So this actually has, has worked out after a lot of uh, lessons and, and, and things like that and headaches to possibly be a useful agronomic story. Okay, I think I'm... Yeah, well, we have these genes in rice, and we're getting high, I'm, I'm just going to run through high, very high increases in yield. So uh, we're actually dealing with Seat and, and Peter Byers, our collaborator, who's the golden rice guy. And we have now fifth-generation rice plants with a gene I haven't talked about. And they actually increase yield. And, he, and I, I said, how much do they increase? And he, he said, what, 30 percent? And I said, oh, is that good? And he started laughing his head off because, yes. So we'll see what happens with this, but these are through the T5s now, and their statistics, all the statistics have been done, not by me, to indicate that these may be a go. So we're trying, we're trying to set up arrangements and, and finances to push this a little far, because we can put them in the Golden A rice background and actually maybe really make this uh, a potentially cool rice variety to try to develop. We're a ways off. All right, I think I'm mercifully done. Yeah, well, obviously I didn't do what any of this work. But I had a lot of good help, and uh, both in my lab, um, you know, in terms of media, and Eric is now working on their sequencing droughts on drought resistant uh, bananas right now. Through the center here, and they did all the bag work. Peter Beyer, our partner over in Germany, who uh, still smokes in the lab, and uh, our partner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Peter, this guy called me on Skype a couple, six months ago, and he goes, hey, I think, I think this, I believe it. I go, what are you talking about? And we thought he was doing transformation because they were having difficulties. No, 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 it looks like they're in growth enhancement, new enhancement. So I put the Skype on, and he's sitting in the hood, smoking. <laughs> <laughs> old school. <laughs> and why we build this? I was a graduate student, all these old colleges. So it's kind of funny, but he's very, very good. I mean, I hope I, I'm going to try to bring him out here, and you'll, you'll see that. He's, he's really, really good. And, is uh, got a lot of interesting stories about the Golden A Rice episodes that he was a part of. Okay, thanks for all the help and thanks for your attention. I have a question. Uh, it's very interesting uh, your presentation. Um, you put a lot of emphasis on reactive oxygen species as one of the mediators. I'm wondering if, uh, what would be the role of ethylene? Ethylene? Yes, in all the story. Is it, does it well, certainly with bananas, ethylene is a big part of the banana story, and one rotten apple and all that kind of stuff. But ethylene also is, is let me see if I, get this right. I think it's, it, it, it's turned on by reactive oxygen. It, it's either a feedback, I, I don't, don't quote me, but ethylene is associated with reactive oxygen species. I think it's, it's, it's reactive oxygen species build up and trigger ethylene production. I did talk about it, but there's an ethylene story in here as well. So, yeah, it's, 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 I can't remember if it's before or after, but there's a feedback each other. So, and, and another thing, too, is that uh, these reactive oxygen species can also be signals to elicit the secondary metabolism. So right. how do you put that into the context of your work in the sense that the plant might be producing ROS as a way to defend themselves uh, through the production of... Sure, that, that's the problem. I mean, ROS can be, again, could be good or bad. In fact, we've, looked, we've done studies where if you put a large amount of react relatively, uh, if you dose them or you, well, how you do your experiment, the large amount of ROS, you'll induce cell death. You take a small amount, and you can do this in a number of ways, and you actually activate the antioxidant system. You actually, these small concentrate, low concentrations 
of ROS actually turn on ascorbate and things like that, actually trigger the antioxidant defense system. So ROS can be toxic, as it used to be, and now it can be more like a signal transduction mediator, which is clearly the case in certain cases. So, but it, but it all depends on localization. It depends on all these variables in which way you go. You know, localization being one, half-life being one. A lot of these guys are, are not, not on a short lip, for example. So it, it really, I hate to be wishy-washy, but it, it depends on the context of what you're looking at and how you are looking at it. They're certainly in the ball game. I, I think that's a safe statement to make. Are there any change in the normal apoptotic process in when you overexpress any of these? Oh, very good. So, you said abnormal? No, 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 like a... Oh, too bad, because this is abnormal. Okay. I've <laughs> given you like, a lot. Well, certainly, like, with these early experiments, we used 35S, constitutive promoter, not the most slickest way to do it, right? And at the beginning, we were so shocked that we got some of these things, we just didn't pay much attention until, until later. And, and what happens is when, you're, when, you, when you do express these constitutively and don't look at copy number, which we now do, you will get all kinds, you, you actually do get a lot of ab abnormalities. You get, so basically what we, what we did is start screening for nuclear number. I mean, we, we, did at, we do agro anyway for low amounts of, of, uh, of, of, of nuclear. But, but my question is whether it, for example, inhibit the inhibit the death of the suspensor cell in the embryogenesis or things like that. Well, that's what well, we think in the banana case definitely is inhibiting death of the, those are embryonic cell suspensions. Uh, so yeah, they, they, but they are. It's all sort of trigger the apoptosis, right? right? Well, you don't know the trigger. In other words, like the, 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 the site of what it hits. I'm not sure what you're asking me. So these are induced apoptosis like a di disease-induced apoptosis, for example. In the, ca in the case of sclerotinium. <coughs> but the, there's a developmentally regulated apoptotic process. Right. Okay. Could be inhibited by what? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's why you get, that's why we think you get developmental abnormalities. Which is what you can see there, there's stunting, there's xylem malformation. I didn't talk about this, cause, but it, it, part of the trade-off is getting, you know, so we find that a lot of the, mal the, the, the funny stuff that happens is due to high levels of expression, copy number. So they're easily culled out now that we know that. At the beginning, we just took the ones that look good. But then we started thinking about it, because you know, it's constitutive driving of, of some of these genes. We think we'd be doing something. And we think it is, in terms of development. And, and those are, these are examples. And this is virus. You know, we've broken down NG-mediated resistance in tobacco. That's what that is. So you get the engine mediated hypersensitive response, you inhibit that and these go systemic and really go right around the RG mediated resistance that is normally induced. In ryegrass there's a, a trait called green gene when it's normally not there and if you cut off the leaves and put them in a petri dish on paper towel they'll ne necrotic in four or five days and when it's present they'll, they'll last about two weeks and just get nothing on they just stay completely dark green. So it'd be interesting to know how that's regulated, huh? Because yeah. that, well, that it's very well... It's a recessive homozygous gene. It's a difficult to work with, yeah. but uh, how it's regulated, I have no idea. Yeah, but that is a plausible scenario for some of the things we would, we'd be doing in, in terms of underlying mechanism, if we, if we could do those experiments. Because if you've got the break on and the break off, and it looks like, you know, in, in your case, you, you, you prevented ripening, you know, it inhibits senescence and things like that. So that would, that, that's not, that's plausible, I would say. Not so easy to prove, perhaps, but plausible. You had mentioned um, earlier with the uh, tobacco that, like you showed the, the two pictures of the wild types that looks clean. It wasn't oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what is kind of the, the point of no return or really the threshold where the fungus has completely um, yeah. you know covered it what have you identified the pathway that you know because obviously it's you know there's something that's telling it okay so now we're going to right the commitment the cell death decision all that stuff so the quick answer is we don't know but in, in this in this, in this slides we were talking about we've done time courses 
So we can we can tell you on the ex and it's all condition dependent. You you do it, it's going to be different than if I did it, depending on on lots of variables. But the bottom line is similar. And we've done this over time to show that after X period of time, and X period of time means when the fungus has has grown has develop has gone through a developmental change in terms of growth. Okay. When that happens, you get a transition from from biotropic prevention of cell death to necrotropic induction of cell death. So it's a transition. But but the pathway that mediates that, actually in any fungus where this happens, is unknown. It's not just us. People would love to know how a, how a biotrope transitions into a necrotrope, which they do. But how that works and what's mediating that even in better developed pathogens in terms of experiment, it's still not clear. But they're really good points, something we would really like to know. So we know what happens, but how and underlying mechanisms and all the good stuff, we really don't, we don't, really don't know. There's plenty of work for people. All right, let's thank Dr. Dick one more time. But because of the social aspects, whatever, in a way, it's not worth the fight. Thank you. <laughs> so there are a couple, there are the, the, the vitamin A, like I said, would be more people to These guys are just selling this every year. They're a couple years, every week, but they're coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's the toxin. I'm trying right now to understand the mechanism. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. The action of aflatoxin taking a course of plant pathology. Yeah, I go. Uh, well, it's not to Oh, okay. But, you know, yeah, so I, I, I'm very interested in how the kernels are. Yeah, that's a good system. It's an important one. Yeah, it's similar to what you talked about. I think there's some, I think there could be some, for sure. Because they're both mediating fungal growth and development, and exactly. cell death, and right. all that right. stuff. Only doesn't kill I'm biased, but I also, <laughs> but I also think it's, it's, it's defensible. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay, well, it's great talk. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs>